Most holy and merciful God, we give you praise and thanks for you are the one who is faithful through times of light and in times of darkness. And it is in those times of darkness, in this bleak midwinter, that we trust that you are at work in our hearts and in our communities and in our church. Bless us now with ears to hear your word that we might sing your praises and trust in your faithfulness. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Well, I was out at uh, Dungavell again this past week, and a friend of mine asked me, well, how are things going out there? And I said, well, it feels a bit like bringing a cup of cold water to someone who is living in the desert. I can't change the heat, nor can I change the dryness of that land, but I can bring a moment's relief. It is a difficult place, a desperate place, really, as our government is moving very rapidly be towards becoming Europe's leading detention state and is already spending almost a quarter of a billion pounds sending money to Rwanda to create a haven where we might dump our so-called illegal migrants and asylum seekers off into someone else's back garden. This, rather than using that 240 million pounds to build affordable housing for our own homeless and for the needs of those who are generally vulnerable. And no, this is not a sermon about that issue. That is for another day. Rather, though, I want to tell you about the testimony of one individual with whom I have struck up a relationship, one who spent three months at Dungavel in the year 2015. And he said, Dungavel is a place where hopes die and dreams are crushed. It is a place that those who live there would rather be in Her Majesty's prison than in Dungavel. And he said, but the visits that we receive from Scottish detainee visitors and others, he says, to me they were like an oasis in the desert. They were like an oasis in the desert, and he says, even now, eight years after the fact, I can still remember their faces, I can still remember what they were wearing, because they were, to me, a moment of relief in that desperate situation. An oasis in the desert. I love that image. Now, I was watching another David Attenborough special, uh, ones that you'll no doubt have seen as well, and it was a it was a special on dinosaurs and how they, they've created these, these uh, computer-generated images of dinosaurs and talked about the life that dinosaurs lived back in the day. I don't know, but this was an episode on dinosaurs that lived in the desert. And the desert then was much the same as it is today, a place of dryness and deprivation. Very difficult to live in the desert, even for clever dinosaurs back in the day. And they said that occasionally, as happens today, there is rainfall in the desert. Rain that, that, that turns dusty stream beds into raging torrents. And I learned something about oases that I had not learned before. And that is that when water falls in one place, it seeps into the ground and has a habit of bubbling up in another place far away. A spring is formed in the midst of the desert, and a drinking space is suddenly there where there was nothing but dust the day before. And animals, then and now, came from miles around to replenish their dry bodies. These oases are literally life-saving occurrences. They are life-saving occurrences life transforming. They don't last forever, but while they do last, they sustain life for the months that come afterwards. Now, you'll know that I've been preaching this little series called Sounds of the Season, where we take those very familiar Christmas hymns and have a closer look at them, because as I've said in the past weeks, hymns are teaching tools for the church to pass on the doctrines of what we believe. And the teachings are in there in writing to stir our minds 
and the music is there to stir our hearts, both of which are joined together as if they are two sides of the one coin, our heads and our hearts joined together in song. So it's well worth our time to stop and consider the words that are so familiar and yet in a strange way so unfamiliar. When we become overly familiar with something, we quickly forget what's actually being said. Now, I will confess that growing up, I used to sing this song just as we did a moment ago, and I never quite understood what it was all about or how it related to the Christmas message, but I just want to read the first verse and let you ask that same question. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan, earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow, in the bleak midwinter, long ago. What is that all about? What, what are we singing about snow on snow on snow? We, we typically think of Christmas and, and having a white Christmas and sitting by the fireside and watching the snow pile up. And we have these very romanticized images of what snow on snow on snow is like. And snow on snow on snow is very nice when you're sitting by the fireside, but when you're outside, when you're homeless, and that snow on snow on snow is falling on your head, or worse, on the heads of your children, it takes on a very different significance, and you would be praying, as I would, that the snow would stop falling. But what this is, it's a metaphor of life. Because you, friends, will know as well as I do that there are seasons of great dryness in life. There are seasons when life is burdensome. There are seasons, as we are in right now, when we hear the dreaded bad news. When we hear that things will certainly not go according to plan. When we hear of things that say, no, your plans are now gone, and this new one, this one that you have dreaded for a long time is actually going to be the one to transpire. And you might look around and think, I see nothing but dust in the desert, or alternately, as this hymn sings, there is nothing but water like a stone, snow on snow on snow, in the bleak midwinter long ago. Now that is the picture that's painted by the author of this hymn. And obviously he or she, it is a, it is a she, Christina Georgina uh, Rossetti, God bless her, wrote this story about Christmas. She wrote this about Christmas not as a word of despair, but rather as a word of hope. Because it was in the bleak midwinter when all seemed lost, or at the very best, all things seemed dormant. And you'll know what it's like in the bleak midwinter. You think, is this going to go on forever? And the feeling of the season is not one of joy, but rather one of heaviness and even despair. This is the place to be. Not the place to fight against, but the place to simply be at rest and trust in God. For it was in that bleak midwinter that one arrived. One who would be called the Son of God, one who would be called Emmanuel, God with us, one who would be named Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not in the glorious sunshine, not when we're prosperous, not when we're life is self-satisfying, not when the barns are filled with grain to overflowing, not when our bank accounts are flourishing or the market is high. No quite the opposite. It comes in the bleak midwinter, when life is hard, when life is difficult, when life is dark. Now, I don't have to fill in the blanks for yourselves because you've all been there, and perhaps you're there, in a sense, 
right now. And if that's the case, then hear this good news, that in the bleak midwinter this one has come. And as I pondered that, I thought to myself, what has come is a tiny voice of protest. A tiny little fist, an infant's fist, rising up and saying no. Saying no to the forces of darkness. Saying no to the despair that often comes in the bleak midwinter. Saying no to the voice that says all is lost. A voice of protest saying no. No, not only to the circumstances of the day, but also to the powers that be. The powers that be, the moneyed powers, the political powers, the powers of, of racism and, and injustice, the powers of exclusion, the powers of intolerance, the, the powers of social marginalization. All of those powers shudder at the sign of this tiny fist raised from the manger. You know the story that when Herod, King Herod, heard that a king had been born in Bethlehem, it says Herod was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Because when the king was disturbed, and by this point he was well deranged, everyone knew that literally heads would probably Roll, and within a very short space of time, heads did roll. Not heads of state or heads of politics, but heads of infants. For in chapter 2 of Matthew, we learn that Herod ordered the execution of every boy under the age of two. So determined was he to retain the power of darkness that he executed little boys. A horrible thing indeed. Now, when Jesus was eight days old, he was taken to the temple, as was the custom of the Jewish people and as remains the custom of the Jewish people today. And there he was presented to God and most likely circumcised, as was the custom, not unlike our own baptism and the sacrament today. And Mary and Joseph would have been thoroughly bewildered as well as being thoroughly delighted by their new infant son. And at the temple, they encountered two people. I'm going to talk about one of them today. Those people were Simeon and Anna. And these were two people who were, walked very closely with the Lord, had a sensitivity to the gentle movements of God's Spirit. And the first one who came to see them was a fellow named Simeon, an old man guided by the Spirit. It says Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace. According to your word, from my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now imagine a strange old man doing that on the day that you brought your own child for baptism. You would be quite speechless, especially when he continued in saying these words. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul as well. This child is is destined for the rising and falling of many in Israel. Now, it's hard when we have these rather saccharine images of the infant Jesus. We anticipate that everyone should fall and bow the knee and worship the infant king. 
It's difficult when we see the lovely nativity plays in the schools and in the churches to imagine that not everyone is going to be happy about the birth of this child. That while it's easy enough to welcome and celebrate an infant who doesn't smile in the face of a new baby, but there were some who shuddered in fear because of that tiny little fist that was raised in defiance against the powers of the day. A tiny little fist that was raised and said, in the bleak midwinter, there remains hope. In the bleak midwinter, when life seems despairing, and water is hard as iron and snow, and snow on snow, that tiny little fist is raised and said, yes, but not forever. Not forever. Now, when I go out to Dungavel, and when you, and when you do your many acts of charity, whether that be as many as you have done feeding the homeless, or perhaps making a donation to a charitable cause of some sort, perhaps offering baked goods to the church, perhaps donating from your excess, perhaps writing to your member of parliament to express your displeasure at a vote. All of these come in the bleak mid-winter. All of these are joining your own fist with that tiny little fist raised from the manger that says no to the powers that be. That voice of protest to say that in the bleak midwinter, no, things will not be this way forever. When we light the Advent candles, that is what we are doing. These are not just lovely candles, though they are lovely. These are lights in the darkness, words of hope that the oppression we sometimes feel and see around the world will one day be turned upside down. That in spite of the fact that the desert may seem dry and lifeless, there is even now falling in another place rain that will seep into the ground and bubble up as a life-giving spring in another place. So friends, I invite you to ponder this hymn and many others. I want, invite you to ponder the reading of this holy word. I invite you to ponder the praises offered today. I invite you to ponder every single thing that is done and said in the name of the Lord Jesus and to consider them as acts of protest against poverty, against injustice, against despair and the loss of hope, for it is in the bleak midwinter that the infant king comes among us and raises that tiny fist and says, no, that spring is coming. Friends, be of good cheer, for though the nights may be dark and long, the day of his revelation will soon be upon us. And may God have the glory this day and always.